um, outside. Where I am, there's snow up in Michigan, and tomorrow I'm going to go searching for the snowflies and other, whatever other snow insects I might find because they, you'll see them if you're in like the northeast area of the USA, you can see um, insects that come out, um, are specialized to come out in the snow, um, especially on days that are hovering, hovering around freezing. So the warmer, but around freezing days. So hoping to see some of those. Um, but yeah, so today, I was gonna be, hi Frank, how's it going? It's gonna be a pretty chill bug scope and we're gonna talk about some, uh, the answer for this week's Wordle week two. And I decided that for the end to Wordle, I'm gonna hashtag all of the tweets that have the puzzle themselves with hashtag end to Wordle. And then um, when I tweet about it the next day, hi Robert, hey Wildcard, welcome to the broadcast. When I tweet about it the next day, like today, Thursday, so that they come out on Wednesday and then I talk about the answer on Thursday. That's how this works. So when I talk about it on Thursday, I will be um, using the hashtag EntoWordle2 or EntoWordle3, depending on what the, um, the topic, sorry, what week we're on. Um, that way it gives some separation from the puzzle itself, the enter wordle puzzle, and the answer. So people should try to give that separation so people who haven't done it yet can still look into it without it being immediately like the answer right there. So that's that's how it's gonna work. Okay. So yeah, hopefully you've done the enter wordle by now. Um, if you haven't, I will put it in the chat here. Pause the replay if you're watching this on replay and go check it out the um, week two enter wordle. I'm going to um, get that link and share it to you, share it with you here in the chat here on haps.com. If you're curious and you're over, I'll post it also on Facebook and then I, I need to, I still need to, I still need to switch my Twitch notification. I realized, oops. Anyway, there's the puzzle if you want to solve it. And then, so now I'm going to talk about what the answer was and show, share with you guys some footage and photographs of intriguing examples of this past week's Enter Wordle. So um, I also think I kind of want to change this camera setup a little bit. One moment. All right, I think that's a little better. Focus here. Okay. Um. Oops. Oh. Sorry, I knocked over the mic. Okay, so yeah, so for this week's Ento Wordle. Wait, is that what you're talking about up there? Wait, you're saying there's a bug in the BG on the wall? In the building? This? I did find a bug here. We have a mar black, a brown marmorated stink bug that has come to join us on the scope. Yeah, <laughs> very observant. Um, oh, it has an injured antenna, but it looks like it's a little trooper here doing well. Um, let's see if I can get the camera to focus on it closely. There it is. Maybe it'll fly for us. Oh, and here's my tortoise beetle ring. Yay! And crab ring, too. Okay. <laughs> it's going to hang out with us here. It's going to hang out on my shirt. All right, so week two's Ento Wordle, the answer is a, is some, first of all, I'll talk about it, around, beat around the bush with it. Um, so the answer of week two Wordle is something that 
is a certain stage of insects. It's a very prominent one, especially famous among butterflies. It's a big part of metamorphosis. And the insects that go through complete metabolism enter this and are and are this. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about, I guess, without just saying. But um, the entomorto was pupae, P-U-P-A-E. And so it's a little tougher of a wordle because it takes up two of the same letters. Um, but uh, the most famous pupa, I'm going to share some pictures here. So let me go up, share my screen to share with you some of the images that I have here today. All right. So the most, the most famous, perhaps, pupa, anyone want to guess what it is? Go ahead and guess in the chat. Or think about it in your head. Oops. All right, so this is perhaps the most famous pupa. This is Metapod from um, Metapod from what's it called Pokemon, and Metapod was one of the original Pokemon, and one of the. Um, Stage, one of like the most famous moves is stiffen or harden uh, because kind of showing how, kind of goes along with how pupae or chrysalises or cocoons, in the case of Lepidoptera, don't really move very much. And so sometimes maybe stiffen is just what they're able to do because <laughs> some, some, no, there are varying degrees of, of hardness. But I'd say that, yeah, Metapod here is probably the most famous um, example of a pupa, don't you think? Have you all heard of it? Um, and pupa and Metapod and Pokemon, of course, comes from Caterpie. You can see Caterpie a little bit in the corner of this image. It looks like it got a little cut off by the way that the screen share works, but in the top left corner there, you can see a little hint of Caterpie. Um, and then uh, Metapod evolves or develops, but in Pokemon, they call it evolves into Butterfree or some sort of Lepidoptera Pokemon. I don't remember exactly which one. So probably the most famous pupa right here, I'd say. <laughs> but let me know if you have another one, if you know of another famous pupa as well. This is the one that I'm aware of. Okay. So now I'm going to, we're going to check out some other pupa and talk about different pupa because there's a lot going on with pupa. All right. Um, maybe we can start with the classic, classic pupa. What classic pupa looks like when someone thinks of pupa, and this one looks kind of like Metapod too. <laughs> I think I've heard of Pokemon. Good. Okay. Oh, interesting. Actually, maybe, whoops. All right, one moment. I'm going to um, actually upload the photo, I think, so I can just share it directly um, onto the screen. I'm still learning about the new haps and getting used to it. OK. Um, Well, I guess here's one. All right, so here is one example of a pupa. And um, so yeah, pupa goes from caterpillar and then goes this huge change where they just kind of close up. They're closed up. They're not going to eat. The um, pupa don't eat. They don't eat. I mean, there could be an exception. I don't know of it, though. They don't eat. They don't drink. They just kind of chill. There does need to be, like, gas exchange, though, oftentimes. Um, but they're all hunkered down and going through this huge body change. They don't completely liquefy and reconfigure as what is sometimes suggested. 
but they do um, start to grow and develop and develop their wings, develop their legs, develop their new, bot their new mouth parts, their new eyes, their new complex eyes. Um, all the magic is happening. And you can also sometimes, I challenge you if you come across a pupa, to see if you can, this one, this is a naked pupa too. This um, pupa had, was covered by some more things, um, but I forget what happened and why it, why it lost its outer coating. I think I forget, but this is a nice way where you can see a little more into what might be inside of like a fuzzy cocoon, for example. I believe this is a tiger moth pupa. You can see the antenna coming from, on the left side, you can see two eyes that are dark and then you can see antenna coming from it. Um, you can kind of see how the wings are on the side a little bit coming inward and then um, the legs are kind of scrunched in there too. You can't see them super distinctly, but, uh, and then those on the right side, all those different layers are abdominal segments, which when this, when this moth, it closes or emerges, it will like kind of expand and puff its body out to assume its full form. But right now it's a pretty compressed version of the insect. Maybe you can think of it like a zip file or... <laughs> but there's a lot, of, a lot of development going on in, in the inside, though, at the same time. So it's not like a dormant situation. Um, okay. And then let me upload the other thing. Um, all right. And then, and this, so this sort of, I'll give you some more vocab as well, if you guys want to learn some new vocab. Yep, bug zip, all that. Um, average time they spend in this phase. We have that question here, thanks. They, when I'm thinking of a pupating insect, usually about two weeks, but it really varies a lot. Um, some flies can take just a couple of days and then there are the insects that have this stage for diapause and they will be under the ground in their under the ground or up in a tree in their pupil form for the whole entire winter so if they choose to go through diapause it can be months and months or if not really choose but if it happens that they pupate and go into diapause because that's their life cycle then many months um, maybe so sometimes it can be almost a year probably Probably in some cases, I don't know, but typically two weeks if they're not going through diapause yet. It's sort of what I start at, and then I try to learn more about the specific species. Um, okay. It's a little clunky to share on the screen. Okay, so here's, so this type, here's a um, vocab word, obtect. So when an insect is, doesn't really move and has its body parts all like together and sort of like glued to the pupa and it's just super immobile and all together like this it's called obtect but then when its body is not all like attached like that and you can see distinct legs like in here with this wasp you can see the distinct antenna that are not all together this is called exeret I'll put the vocabulary word in the chat so you guys can um, see it as well. So exert, such as this hymenoptera. Um, and yeah, although I think typically what's portrayed as object, I'll put that in the chat too. Unfortunately, these words have six letters in them, not five, so I can't use them for the world just yet. But maybe once, hi Pablo, how's it going? Um, but maybe once when we progress to the to six letters with n wordle which will happen, these will be potential, these are candidates for future n wordles Okay, um, one thing that I should say too about this type of, um, well, I guess specifically for, for this pupa, um, this one I found inside of a mud home. So it wasn't just completely naked and helpless like this. This is totally easy prey for any, any insectivore out there, for a bird, for a lizard that's looking for a meal. Um, so oftentimes people will be protected in various ways. And for example, this one you can see here, this was 
I think this is like a mud dauber. I forget exactly a mud dauber. This is from Borneo. This is some sort of mud dauber, maybe wasp that was protected inside of this home crib that its mom made for it. Um, and then I took a, and then I checked it out and found its pupa inside. Really beautiful. And you can see a scale bar down here in the corner. Those lines are millimeters if you want to get a sense of the size. All right, Steve, hello. Grading papers, nice. Um, two weeks in a row now. Oh, coming to the bug scope, yes, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, if you wanna pop on and say hi, Steve, too, you're welcome to, if you wanna talk about pupa and what you see. Um, I will send you an invite just in case. I mean, you have it just about pupa, so. <laughs> All right, and you can you can comment on what you see if you want to too. So, if you want to pop on, I sent you an invite. Um, because it's been a while since I've had you on the bug scope. Yes, making you procrastinate. <laughs> um, I didn't specifically talk about incomplete metamorphosis and complete metamorphosis yet, but um, what I I have. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna share. I'm just gonna share all the photos um, by sharing my screen because I think it's gonna be an easier way for me to show everybody this since I didn't already upload them. Upload the files. Oops. Oh yeah, this is right. Okay. Wait. Okay. Yes. Here we go. The order, I don't, it's not that, that ordered though, so forgive me about that, but here we go. Um, okay. All right. Yes, so, okay. So yeah, here's, here are the, here's the wasp we were just looking at. And can zoom in more. Okay. There we go. That's decent, I suppose. Okay. And this way I can zoom in. This is, okay, awesome. Yeah, so here you can really zoom in and see. You can see those little baby wings that are popping out and getting ready to uh, developing. So one day this, um, this wasp can fly around and find a mate and provision her own nest. Okay, and then, um, oh, another example of object of object um, pupa are the tortoise beetle here, where you can really see, so it looks really weird, I realize. I'll give you an explanation on what's going on here. So um, here you can see the edge of what's going to be the exoskeleton. You can see the face. Oh, can you see my, oh, you can see my mouse, awesome. You can see the face right here. You can see the legs. It just looks kind of like mummified and all grouped together. So this is clearly a very immobile pupa. Um, I think it's really cool to see how everything is fit together here. Like you can see all the little feet, one, two, three, one, two, three on either side. So you can see those six legs. You can see its, its palps around its mouth up in the front. Zoom in more so you can really see um, up here. And then if you go down, um, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but like I wonder if all of these are like plates that fuse to form that exoskeleton around it. I'm super curious to see a time lapse or something of a tortoise beetle leaving its exoskeleton. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm so curious um, to see what's going on with this part of, and if that fuses together later. And then here, right here is some glue that it was glued onto like a leaf, um, but I of course took it off so, to photograph it. And here are just some, um, leftover um, final shed exoskeleton of the insect. Okay. Um, and then here's the top, which is, looks basically the same, but you can't see all those features. Oh, but what you can see are the abdominal segments here and what look like what might soon be spiracles with the, these dark patches or maybe that paler patch, but a lot of mystery still. And the leftover fecal shield, which maybe that's fungal growth, I'm not sure, 
It's kind of taking advantage of that organic material that was left behind. So, yeah. Thanks, Pablo, saying that the details are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so when insects are in there, people, I'm going to go back to this one in case people are disgusted by the other one. Although, if you're disgusted by the other one, you're probably also disgusted by this one, but hopefully fascinated as well. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that, yes, yeah, so in the pupal stage, you're going from the caterpillar or larval stage, which is a stage primarily focused on growth and getting energy, going into this pupal stage, which is a period of dramatic changes when you develop the wings and adult forms. It's, it's basically puberty for the insects. And then and not all insects go through this. It's only the ones that go through complete metamorphosism, like the flies, like butterflies and moths, like beetles, like for example, ladybugs do this. They have a larval form too. And a pupa, and then, um, and their pupa is exerate. And then also wasps, hymenoptera. But like stink bugs don't go through a pupa like this. Like our friend we saw at the beginning of this broadcast does not have a pupa. It just um, molts and generates its wings, develops them over time over each molt. Okay, but one, so one thing that the, the insects are when they come to the pupal stage, they're rather um, resourceful. And so, so when they're in their pupal stage, they are not interested in finding a mate. They're not there yet in their life. They are, like a big focus is um, anti-predation, uh, is avoiding predators and being eaten. So there's various ways they can do this. Um, in other stages is aposematic coloration, which means they have bright colors to warn things that they're poisonous that doesn't happen as much in in, in the pupil form. Um, what really usually happens is camouflage um, or hiding. And in this case, here is a tiger moth of some kind that was really resourceful and used its um, hairs or its CD from its caterpillar stage. Tiger moths are very, very fuzzy caterpillars. And it used it to create this cover all around its body on this twig here. You can see its last, it's probably um, its waist or its last pupil molt um, down here in the corner on the right side. That's, that's probably the one waist. And then every, all the hairs were turned into this really cool web of protection around its body. And I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but maybe these could also be irritating hairs that would also add further protection, like if something tried to eat it, they get a mouthful of these pokey hairs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, mimicry can be one too. I don't know if I have an example of a mimicking pupa, Steve. Do you know, do you know one? Okay. Um, so when I mentioned wasps, oh, and also in the spirit of what the enterwortle was, pupae, pupae is the plural of pupa. I didn't say that yet. <laughs> Um, so this is a pupa right here. Let's take a look at some pupae. Although, I don't even know if this counts, honestly, but I'll just get to show you here. Okay, so here um, is a caterpillar that, um, it's a probably a tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm. You can see its head over here. It's spiracles for breathing down the side. It's three legs on this side. There'll be three legs on the other that we can't see. It's pseudo legs. It's covered with um, the cocoons, although they're empty. So I don't know if we'd call them pupa anymore, but there used to be tons of pupae all over this caterpillar that have now left um, there. It's a, this, I don't know about you guys, but the, I, I do have a little bit of a hard time looking at these pictures. I think I have a little bit of, what's it called again? When like a lot of little holes bother you. I forget what it's called, but um, cause it's a lot of little holes here. Anybody remember what the name of that condition is? <laughs> but yeah, these are not eggs. I definitely thought that these, yeah, and these are very plural. Yes. <laughs> I definitely thought that when I was younger, I thought these were eggs. I just didn't understand what was going on, but these are cocoons that were made by a wasp that laid its eggs inside of the caterpillar. And then inside the caterpillar, those little wasps, wasp babies, um, ate the guts and inside of the caterpillar and then finally popped out of the caterpillar skin and started spinning a cocoon 
around their bodies, a silken cocoon. Silk isn't only in moths and butterflies, but also in other groups like wasps. And then they pupated inside and they popped the top, top off and flew away to find other yummy caterpillars and mates. Um, oh, trypophobia. Yes, thank you. That's the, um, the, the fear of lots of little holes or lots of holes. And that would definitely get people with this. It definitely gets me a little bit. Um, so yeah, here you can see a zoomed out picture of what's going on. I think this is on kale or some sort of green like that. And there's that horn that distinguishes it to be in this spingety family, hawk moth family. So yeah, these are cocoons or these were pupae, but now they're empty pupil cases. That's what I'd call them now. All right. Um, okay. Coming down here. Uh, this would probably be better for earlier in the broadcast, I suppose, but you can see the beginning of the making of the pupa and the end of the pupal stage as well, in addition to an intermediate pupae in the center there. Because on the left side is a monarch caterpillar who's just entering the phase, um, the pupal phase, and you can see as a caterpillar still, it's, um, it's connected itself to the substrate it's chosen to pupate on, aka in this case, the top of this mesh, metal mesh enclosure that someone who was raising monarchs had kind of set them up in. And it's um, starting to, it's just getting in position to be ready to um, molt into its people stage. And then you can see in the middle, farther away, that's what's blurry is a kind of in the middle of the process uh, pupa. And then finally, on the right side, you can see a a monarch, cat monarch butterfly pupa that's about to emerge or a close. That's the name of when it's leaving that, that pupal stage. Eclosion is about to happen. You can see the pupa. You can see, sorry, you can see the adult basically at this point through the exoskeleton of the pupa. And any, any time, any moment now, any hour, it's going to come out into its an adult form as its beautiful uh, adult. Uh, butterfly um, formation, ready to go and fly, perhaps to Mexico. Okay, here you can see it has some gold on it too. It's green, which is good for camouflage, but it also has some gold. I'm not sure why, but things in nature are shiny. Water drops are shiny, so maybe that, that helps in that way. Um, and then here is an example of a moth that had finished pupating. On the outside, a tiger moth of some kind, I believe, based on all the hairs and whatnot. This is in Borneo, and so oftentimes what happens is when they do emerge from their pupil casing, they will crawl out on top of it, and that's where they'll dry so that they can pump out their wings with hemolymph and air, and then hemolymph, I guess, probably for wings, but their body, sometimes um, air is involved, and then they can fly away. This one almost looks like it has a scary face right here. See what I mean? Like eye, eye, like clown nose and scary mouth. Good Halloween moth. I don't know what species it is. Oh, good luck with, good luck with grading, Steve. Reminds you of Aztec drawings, Pablo. Interesting. Yeah, they're, they're really like, in, like really strong marks and yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes this is a swallowtail butterfly. Oh, wow. I didn't really notice the head formation and everything before until I looked at it just now, but okay. Let's, so this, so sometimes they'll use silk. This is an example of how they'll use silk to add structure and support. So here's structure and support here going down to the body wrapping around. It really amazes me how they pull this off and it's just so ingrained in their DNA of how to go about um, like silking themselves up and arranging themselves for a pupation. So here's the tip of the abdomen. You can see each of the segments here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, either 10 or 10. Um, typically insects have 10 abdominal segments and then spiracles here one very distinct ones um, right here. And then up here at the top, wow, I did not notice this before until now, but you can really see the face. There's, I think, where the eye will be. 
Here's like the nose area. I mean, nose is, a, is not really like the right term to use with an insect because they don't really have like a nose that they use for breathing, but I'm just calling the tip of their face, of its face a nose in this case for relatability. Um, but you, oh darn it, I see it's a little fuzzy, coming through a little fuzzy, so I'll, I'll slow down in hopes that um, it'll clear up through the broadcast. Go, picture, go. Through the interwebs and screens beyond. Maybe I'll zoom out. I don't know if that makes a difference. Or move to a different one. Or... All right, well, hopefully it'll clean up, clear up in a moment. <clears throat> But yeah, so typically, um, I'll just talk about some pupa things. Typically, pupa are dormant, but there are some that can move around a bit. Maybe un and reshare the screen. Yeah, I'll try that too. Definitely in the past, it's usually cleared up on its own, which I'm hopeful for, but I'll try that for now. Yeah, not working yet. Um, I'll I'll turn it off for a moment, and maybe I can. Maybe if I. Wait, I didn't turn it off again. Oh, I did. I'm going to. Okay, right, I'm gonna try uploading a couple of the photos that are next. Um, and seeing if that helps if I can kind of work around that way for now. Yeah, so most are dormant, but there are some that can, sometimes if you see a pupa and disturb it, it will bend its body as a sort of um, minor way to scare something off or cause something to reconsider disturbing it. And then other times they will, um, wait, let me... Oh, and then there's some some pupa, like snakefly pupa, which can bite potentially and even walk a little bit, which is very strange and unusual. But most of the time, they're rather still. And um, actually, there's some too that can make an auditory sound, but those are way less common. All right, let's try this again. Sharing screen. Hmm. Yeah, it's not working. Here's the before, though, that we can at least blurrily see before going back over. Um, I feel like this would be, this is like a good opportunity to play if it was on purpose to play. What are you looking at? That that game where it starts really blurry and it gets less blurry and less blurry and less blurry until you can see it really well. Um, but, oops. Okay, I will try to... Um, I'll try to just upload some of the photos directly to HAPS. That might be... That might work. Um, I just don't, oh, here. I wasn't sure where the folder was where I had these images, but I found it. Okay. Stop presenting. And then... Okay. Oh, but I can't zoom in this way, so it's not as ideal. Darn. Anyway, but up here you can see... And I can't really point to you either this way. But anyway, like up here at the top, you can see, if you zoom in, the antennae that come across on the right side and upper side of the body of this chrysalis. Um, another 
example of protect chrysalis a chrysalis being protected. Do I have a zoomed in picture of this one? Not sure if I do. Let's see. Um All right, I don't have a zoomed in picture ready to go at the moment, but and I'll try to present to screen again in a moment as well. But here's another example that I found, I think a more extreme example of, I don't know what's going on here, but there's a pupa inside of that structure that is all protected by this lattice of, I'm not sure what it is, of, I don't know. <laughs> this is from Colombia uh, near the Amazon. Um, and it's quite the mystery, but it's definitely, I think, some type of Lepidoptera. Yeah. Hello, the internet. How are you? Oh, you're saying hello from YouTube. Hi. I'm broadcasting from Haps.co. All right. Let me try to, I'm going to try to share screen again the way that I had been doing it before. So if we can see, see if we can get back to that. All right. Oh, oh no, it looks worse than before. Is there anything I can, do? is there any, anything on my end I can do? Like if I close a window or something? I don't know. Or close, I have Lightroom open. Maybe closing Lightroom will help. I don't know. Darn. Oh, well. All right. I'll upload a couple more than maybe share some of them on Twitter, the things I didn't get around to. But um, a couple of things that I want to share with you guys is I want to end it on a mysterious pupae situation. And yes, it's plural that I found when I was in Borneo. So here's, so here's a reason why Chrysalises need and pupa need protection because not only birds but hungry um, ants might come along here. Some weaver ants that found a yummy, tasty pupa to devour. The internet, I'm not in Sweden. I'm over in Michigan in the USA. Um, yes. Okay. And then. Here are the mystery pupa that I don't know what they were, also from Borneo. Um, maybe some sort of fly, but I really don't know. And it also looked like, there, looked like there were some water droplets on the tail end of them. I don't know what was going on with that, but it was, they were all clustered together on some sort of log, and I was really puzzled and curious about what they were. If I had um, like more time when I was there, cause when I was in Borneo back in 2015, I was there to assist with orangutan field work. And so I, didn't, I had limited free time to explore the insects and whatnot. And it was tricky to have, have, a, have a setup there for rearing insects because ants, like the ants that you saw a moment ago, would come along and eat whatever I was trying to keep alive if there was any way to get into the container. So... Um, when I go back for my Fulbright, it will, I'll probably be able to do a little more rearing of the insects since um, that, that will be the focus. Bugs will be in focus for that, but, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're a pupa, it's like you set yourself up well in a secure location, protected, and then like you just hunker down and focus on your me time on the inside for your internal change that's happening. Um, oh, cheers. Cheers, the internet. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I wonder what I was saying when you thought I said Stockholm. <laughs> um, Steve here on HAPS is asking, can you think of any, off topic, but can you think of any insects that can be Valentine's Day themed? Maybe not the color, but heart, heart shaped. Oh yeah unique mating ritual, etc. I mean, definitely damselflies. Um, 
I didn't, I did not think about that when I was thinking of themes for, or what to talk about this week. Cause I was just, just thinking of the wordle, but there was a Valentine's day in the past when I did a Valentine's themed broadcast about chocolate since chocolate is frequently exchanged on Valentine's day. And what, who do we have to thank for chocolate? in addition to the people who cultivate it and everything like that. Flies. Flies pollinate the cacao plants and make chocolate possible. So uh, for, for Valentine's Day, I like to talk about flies. <laughs> and then, yeah, damselflies make their heart shape when their bodies come together um, to mate. I don't have a photo of that to share, unfortunately, but um, if you just look up mating damselflies, it's... It's all over the internet, so, um, so yeah. Yes, these are very plural. I like <laughs> as well. Um, I wonder if there are any heart-shaped insects. Yeah, I've come across like a couple insects that have a heart on them. Let me see if I have any to quickly to pull up in honor of Valentine's Day coming up. But um, I bet you there's some sort of weird like hemipteran or stink bug or scutellarid or something that has a, that's weirdly heart shaped, heart, heart shaped, not harp shaped, but because there's insects like with all sorts of different shapes, like definitely not heart shaped, but if you guys have seen the lychee bug, I'm trying to see if I have a picture of it. Um, here it is. Oh, how do I show you guys? I mean, I don't know how to show you, but I'll upload it. Here's a nice pink one that I imagine it's a heart. It's not a heart, but All right. Okay, not a heart, but a nice pink one for Valentine's Day. It's a rectangle. So if you just like, you know, round the edges, round three, your instructions are round three edges, keep one edge and then put a little dent and then push, push it together and put a dent at the top and you'll have this bug as a heart. <laughs> oh yeah, drain flies are kind of heart shaped. But not very, like, not a very romantic natural history when you think about how the larvae are living in the drains, feeding on the organic buildup of material. And yeah, perhaps the kissing bug, but also another dark. I think, I think you're, Steve, I feel like this is a good setup for a dark Valentine's Day broadcast or something like that. <laughs> oh. Thanks, the internet. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Nice to meet you. Do you have a favorite insect, the internet? And is the internet the, your preferred uh, name that I call you? Oh, thanks, Frank. And you set the location for Borneo. Yeah, I think I will... Did you isolate one when you used the Seek app or did you have all of them in the frame? Another question. The lychee bug, right? Yeah, anyway. All right, all of them. Yeah, I wonder if it might recognize one of them. It might, it, we could maybe get to family if we have one of them, but we can try. Excuse me. Um, oh, cheers, Steve. Okay, cool. Well. I think I'll wrap up the broadcast now unless there's other things you guys want to talk about or Steve if you want to hop on and say hi or Frank for that matter or the internet or any bugs out there that want to fly in before we end. Oh, there's an ant over here too. But here's, a, here's our bug friend. One last time. Little brown migrated stink bug. I don't know how close this will focus. 
They're kind of focusing there. Kill it. No, not in the winter. I need all the bugs I, I can find. <laughs> oh, I smell it. <laughs> nice and stinky. I don't think, I don't find them to be too horrific of a smell, but wow. Usually I don't find brown marmorated, brown marmorated stink bugs to be like that smelly. Um, but for some reason, this one just unleashed it all. <laughs> if only I could send you guys the smell of the microphone. <laughs> Your favorite bug's a caterpillar. Oh, that's pretty appropriate for this broadcast since caterpillars go turn into... Oh, I think it's... Are you hungry, friend? I can give you some food. I don't have food that nearby, but maybe I can get... I want some of my tea. You want some tea? Tea time. Nope, not interested in tea. Oh, yes, interested in tea. No, interested in tasting tea, but not in sticking around to drink the tea. I saw its little proboscis stick out. Um, yeah, I feel like when I smell a stink bug, I'm, I'm like, I know I'm supposed to not like your smell, but I don't mind it too much. <laughs> Oh, really? Steve is saying that he has a dog, that if a dog or cat smells it, they will freak out. I wonder if they're like more poisonous to cats and dogs than they are to people, or if maybe as an entomologist, um, I'm just more used to them and know that I'm not going to eat it so I don't have to worry about it or what. I wonder how that um, comes into play. Yeah, maybe or maybe this, yeah, maybe it didn't want tea because it wants coffee. I also have a little bit of um I bet you would like this. Come here. I bet you it would like this um apple cider that I have here. Do you want some apple cider? Yes, it does. It's like, yes, please. We'll we'll stop for apple cider. Let's see if I can show. Don't focus on me. Oh, never mind. Took a little sip and kept kept on. But it's still trying to taste, actually. Oh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll wrap up the broadcast now. Um, thanks, guys, for coming by. Um, nice to meet you, the internet. And stay tuned for next Wednesday when I post Ento, the Ento Wordle for week three. I'm also going to share a couple of the photos that I shared on today's broadcast on my Twitter for those who don't pop into this broadcast but aren't want to talk about the answer. So, Valentine's Day special or not? <laughs> um, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. Um, prob probably not because I'm, um, I'm kind of traveling-ish right now and I'm going back to Georgia on... I'm going back to Georgia on... Tuesday, actually. Yeah. But um, if you want to do a Valentine's Day special, Steve, let me know. I'll set you up on the platform. You can chat about the B Day bugs. We all, we're all set up for that broadcast now from the brainstorm earlier. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thanks everyone for popping by, for participating in the Ento Wordle and chatting. If you have a request for the bug scope, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you guys later. Cheers. Take care and have a great, wonderful weekend filled with, and hopefully you'll see a cool bug. Cheers.